Yeah, good to go. All right. Welcome everyone to uh, this, uh, I guess, afternoon, evening, maybe night session of uh, searching for intersectional justice, a research uh, roadmap. My name is Matthew Chase. I'm the San Marcos campus librarian. So that's why I was a little unsure about if it's uh, afternoon or evening for y'all, like depending on where you're joining us from. Um, but yeah, and uh, definitely welcome. So this, uh, this session is particularly unique among the uh, iLearn events because it's actually part of a series. I don't know if you're aware, um, but it's essentially the kickoff event really for the context event series, which is essentially a series of events and other types of programs that uh, seek to promote and advance equity and inclusion and justice in, um, in research as well as through research. Uh, so this is kind of one of the ways that uh, the library's wanting to, to really uh, work on that end, especially when it comes to uh, themes and topics and issues regarding diversity, inclusion, and equity. And so this is kind of like our very small part in terms of uh, working towards that. Uh, for the whole uh, university community. So hopefully there will be some really good insights, but what we really wanna to welcome too is uh, your own voices, your own perspectives, your own thoughts and comments and, and ideas and experiences. So at any point uh, during the session, you can always feel free to share or not share. It's really up to you because sometimes there, uh, some of these topics and themes can be um, relatively difficult or it can be, um, and in, in foster feelings of um, vulnerability. And so really uh, for us to, to navigate that, you know, you, you treat to yourself uh, in, in the sense of like pacing yourself in, in that sense, uh, in whatever way feels most comfortable to you. So completely understand on that, on that end. But something I wanted to stress uh, at, at the forefront, but, uh, but yeah. Again, thank you uh, for, for joining in this session to really uh, dive deeper into these type of topics and, and issues and, um, and realities that we really need to, uh, to address as researchers, as practitioners, as professionals of all kinds, even as a librarian myself, it's definitely something that uh, we need to uh, address. In addition to you as either a student, maybe a faculty, an emerging practitioner yourself, or, or a working one, uh, currently. So with that, uh, let's, uh, let's move on. So essentially this, uh, this session is really going to be kind of, uh, like I said, kind of serving as a kickoff to the context event series, uh, basically by introducing the, the notion or the perspective uh, known as intersectionality, which is kind of part of the uh, title. And if you're not really familiar with what intersectionality is, don't worry, that's actually going to be part of this whole session. Um, again, I kind of framed it more uh, around being a, kind of an introduction to, um, to a topic like intersectionality and um, how deep and how um, extensive this type of landscape can be when it comes to uh, analyzing these type of issues. And how can we really apply it to our research, especially if you're working as a, a health sciences clinician or just as, a, uh, as an evidence-based practitioner? How do you incorporate something that might be as complex as intersectionality uh, in a way that's practical, that actually works to impact the communities that you hope to, uh, to, uh, to support? So with that, uh, before I, I guess I go into the, uh, to the meat of it, I actually almost forgot is that there is a, for students uh, a contest entry. So if you're a current student, uh, just make sure, I really just encourage to have your name uh, be reflective of your first and last name. Sometimes, you know, when you come into to Ring Central, kind of defaults to either like your first name, but then it just says like iPhone or something like that. So just make sure that it reflects your, your name on there. And really you can just, uh, you know, go on to participants, go uh, hover over your name and then basically just rename yourself. If you have any issues later on about that, feel free to let me know. But yeah, essentially I believe there is five or six uh, gift cards on the line. So basically for each session that you're attending, um, you kind of increase your odds of uh, being able to uh, win a gift card. So 
And this is happening all the way through March 31st. So feel free to attend other sessions as well. So also to kind of give a little bit more context about who I am, because I think that is kind of an important thing uh, that we sometimes miss out as being facilitators or presenters or some sort of quote unquote expert of, uh, or authority of something uh, is to provide a little bit more transparency as to you know, our own positionality, our own uh, experiences, our own background and where we're kind of coming from in terms of providing this type of information to you because ultimately, even though I'm gonna to try to give you a per, hopefully a very solid introduction into intersectionality, it's still gonna be colored by my own um, lens, by my own knowledge of it, by my own approach to it. And so uh, that, that's kind of why I wanna uh, provide this type of uh, clarification about who you're, uh, who you're listening to. Um, so, uh, basically, yeah, my name again is Matthew Chase. I am a librarian at the San Marcos campus. Uh, if you're wondering about the MASP degree, uh, basically I do have a um, uh, academic background in sociology, which is kind of what happened to funnel a lot of my interest, my passion, a lot of my knowledge when it comes to these type of uh, uh, fields of knowledge. So that's kind of like where I'm kind of coming from is more from that academic end. Um, also, just to clarify too, is that I am a white US, uh, USian, essentially meaning, yeah, I'm white and I'm also um, a, uh, an inhabitant of the United States, essentially. Um, and then also, um, I'm cisgender male. I think I have a misspelling there. My apologies for that. But if you're wondering what cisgender means, uh, essentially it refers to someone who uh, identifies with the uh, gender and or sex that they were assigned at birth. So that would be me in this case. So I was, I, I was assigned as a male at birth and I identify as such. I'm also a heterosexual, heteromantic. Uh, so altogether that pretty much makes me cishet. Uh, it's a nifty abbreviation that I've come to find <laughs> to, to define all that. Um, all that um, seeming jargon, but honestly, once you kind of get used to the language, it's it's uh, a lot more uh, it's a lot more natural <laughs> as time goes on for me, at least. Um, I do identify with uh, he, him, his pronouns, and also uh, the last part is the fact that I'm just a critical optimist. And I, as a quick description of what exactly that means. By optimist, I just mean that I do believe that things can get better. I don't think that things are, you know, that they only are as they are, you know, like, you know, like uh, it's just it's just the way things are. I think, no, we can really build upon uh, improving for our communities, for ourselves, for, you know, the greater populations around the world. Uh, but I am a critical optimist. So by critical, I really mean is um, even though I'm very optimistic that we can improve upon things, I'm also critical about like, how are we doing that? How are we measuring that type of progress or improvement? Who's being um, uh, supported and who's maybe being left behind? So I think that's something to be um, more aware of. So with that, uh, anyway, it's just, a, uh, this slide is kind of just, a, again, a, a source of transparency as well as for you, a tool for evaluating um, the information that I'm providing as well. And uh, another thing is to contextualize, why does this even matter in the first place? Why are we even discussing these type of issues? Um, and especially if you're, you're kind of new to it, you know, you might have that genuine question, like, why does this matter? I feel like I'm doing my part, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, and you know, I think I'm, I'm good where I'm at. <laughs> but honestly, for all of us, uh, no matter who you are, we can all definitely um, uh, work further and, and go further in terms of our efforts, in terms of our uh, discussions and dialogues and, and so on and our actions in terms of uh, moving us toward a more equitable uh, uh, world uh, or reality, I guess. And so with that, I kind of want to also contextualize why this actually matters for clinicians, why this matters for health sciences researchers uh, in particular. So I have a couple 
uh, different uh, points to make here is that with most clinicians, especially when you're uh, following the evidence-based uh, medicine or practice movement, which is definitely a, a, a great step forward in terms of providing improved patient care and patient outcomes and such. Um, the thing is, though, even with the evidence-based uh, practice movement, it does have its limits because, unfortunately, most clinicians are finding and using the evidence from research that is predominantly based on a white cis male uh, population. So in that case, uh, a population that reflects me in particular, uh, personally. Uh, and so as a result though, because in, if we were focusing on the US uh, in particular, the, the population within, and as we are getting increasingly diverse, this approach to the evidence can really exclude certain populations, uh, namely BIPOC, which is black indigenous people of color, uh, or LGBTQIA plus uh, communities um, and, and more from really fully benefiting from clinical intervention because there's gonna be those disparities in terms of who is uh, receiving uh, better care, better outcomes, or how certain interventions are maybe only being uh, beneficial to certain populations versus others because the research unfortunately is, is that limited. It's that uh, unfortunately biased in that sense. So even as we try to uh, increase our commitment to research-based type of evidence and, and, uh, pra and practice, uh, there's definitely limits to that. And, and as researchers and practitioners alike, we definitely have some responsibilities to address that. So ultimately, uh, the question then leads into, well, what can we do to really kind of help resolve that? Um, and really, intersectionality might provide a really good uh, basis uh, for, for that type of work, for that type of discussion and dialogue. Uh, but ultimately, it kind of raises the question, what exactly is intersectionality? Uh, especially for those of you who might not be readily familiar with it or maybe not have a academic background like mine that's like centered around like the social sciences and sociology, I would completely understand. Uh, but actually intersectionality is a pretty interesting um, history to it in terms of where it developed actually. So it originally came uh, about and, and originally coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a uh, a lawyer, a legal scholar, a, um, an activist as well. And you might be wondering, well, a legal scholar, right? <laughs> so how does this actually relate back to diversity, equity, and inclusion? How does this relate back to health sciences? Well, intersectionality originally came about as a, as a concept for Kimberly Crenshaw um, as a result of um, during the 1980s, particularly intersectionality uh, was coined in 19. Uh, 1989, uh, but it came about because it was in response to how the courts and, and legal institutions uh, were essentially uh, trying to navigate the complexities of, of race and, and gender and so on. And by navigating though, unfortunately, that navigation was super limited because in the, in the legal courts at the time, um, it was recognized that if, if um, a black woman per se, and this is actually in the case of uh, what Kimberly Crenshaw was analyzing, uh, came forth with a uh, complaint or you know a legal case that involved uh, harassment or some sort of discrimination as a black woman. Essentially, in the legal courts, you were had to either choose a case that pursued the racial-based harassment or the gender-based harassment. You couldn't pursue them as both. And ultimately, Committee Crenshaw kind of identified that as a, a serious gap in terms of how we were really addressing these different uh, aspects of our experiences, of our lived experiences in terms of race and gender, and how the legal courts and other types of systems or institutions were kind of re trying to reduce it and, and, and divide them into these very compartmentalized categories that maybe didn't really make sense. Because ultimately, with our lived experiences, we're kind of muddled with a bunch of different intersect, uh, intersecting uh, identities and, and components to that and to our identity when it comes to um, our socioeconomic status, when it comes to our up, up, uh, up, oh, sorry, upbringing, our uh, ge uh, geographical location even, our language that we speak, 
um, and, and race and ethnicity, um, sexuality uh, and gender and so on. I mean, there's a whole host of different uh, components to who we are and how those different components really influence our lives on a, on a day to day basis. And so intersectionality was kind of offered as a lens um, and kind of as the quote goes in which you can see where power comes and collides, where you can see those barriers, where you can see those privileges being kind of enabled or uh, activated and where they can interlock and intersect at different points in our uh, everyday experiences. And that it's not simply that there's a race problem here or gender problem there or a class or LGBTQ problem uh, somewhere else. Uh, and as the quote goes, many times that framework erases what happens to people who are, sub who are subject to all of these things. And uh, this goes for people who, um, well, it, it pretty much talks about how intersectionality can be applied to people who have identities that might privilege them in some ways, where they have less obstacles or barriers or maybe uh, certain types of advantages that are conferred to them just by prospect of who they are and other times disadvantages or barriers or challenges or discriminatory uh, experiences and so on and how you can have kind of a, a mix of both or they all kind of like just overlap upon each other in different ways and sometimes those identities uh, are activated in certain contexts and maybe not activated in other uh, types of situations too so it, it just tries to provide a little bit more uh, revelation to the complexity of our lived experiences rather than compartmentalizing them or trying to put these fixed type of labels on them. So with that, that's kind of where inter intersectionality can be a really useful lens to that, to being a little bit more of a critical thought uh, framework uh, to be applied and really um, uh, can reconsider our own experiences and our own uh, behaviors and interactions with others. Uh, so at that point, I just want to make sure, does that kind of definition, um, is there anything I could clarify about that or anything that you might have questions about or comments about as well before we kind of move on? Just want to make sure because it's, it's a, definitely a complex um, theoretical perspective for sure. Let's see, so I already see there's a like symbol, which is good. I'm gonna uh, uh, assume that's probably a, a good point in the sense we're all on the same page as well. But again, if there's any point where you kind of want to retrace something, or maybe there's something I said that doesn't quite mesh with what I said previously, and you want to kind of decipher that a little bit more, feel free. You can always do it in the chat. You can unmute yourself uh, at any point and, and so on. So with the next thing, I have is kind of kind of give us a little bit more of a, a hands-on introduction into intersectional uh, uh, intersectionality. I kind of have this short activity where we can um, briefly talk about our experiences and our, and our identities, perhaps in a more personal way than we might otherwise, just to kind of give a little bit more of a uh, acknowledgement to it uh, than we may otherwise do in our everyday kind of purposes. Uh, I do want to stress that this activity, I'm not going to record it uh, just in case you're, um, you know, um, wary about that. And I completely understand on that, on that, on that point uh, for any reason uh, at all, or you feel kind of uncomfortable with it. And also to that point, I do want to stress that this activity is completely voluntary. Hopefully like the activity itself is not necessarily um, uh, too difficult. I, I try to make it as, as, as easy and simple as possible, kind of just more of a casual type of reflection. Uh, but I completely understand that if, if there's uh, any reason that you don't want to participate. Uh, but yeah, I just want to say I did adapt this from a, an activity from the Safe Zone Project, and it was actually inspired by Dr. Jennifer Summers, one of the faculty at the university, and uh, uh, particularly in the OT program. Uh, she had done this in a, in a prior session of a, of a different sort. And so it kind of inspired me to kind of incorporate it as well. Perfect. 
Uh, so yeah, returning back from the activity, uh, essentially we kind of want to continue is like, where can we actually apply intersectionality now that we have a little bit of an introduction to it and really apply it to research? Because you might kind of, especially from that activity or maybe even just the definition of intersectionality, it can seem rather abstract in the sense that it doesn't, it seems to be trying to approach a lot of different things uh, simultaneously, which could be a lot of work. Uh, if you were trying to apply it to as a as a researcher or as a practitioner, but ultimately there are some strategies to really kind of take into mind some questions that you should probably ask yourself uh, during certain interactions when it comes to a research subject or a patient and so on. When it comes to um, using intersectionality, because for me I always kind of I always saw intersectionality as kind of a, a research roadmap. Um, and it would help you kind of navigate those different, you know, avenues and directions and so on. But the other thing to intersectionality and as a roadmap, the roadmap is not fully fleshed out. It's not fully written. Um, and it's up to you to kind of uh, discover those, you know, those gaps and those, and those unknowns and really help to uh, map them out um, in, in your own approach to, to research and to evidence-based practice. And so with, with that, a uh, couple points kind of to talk about here is to define your approach to research or evidence-based practice with equity in mind. I think with whatever research project you're doing or whatever uh, you know, practical scenario that you're, you're facing, it's always important to keep equity, at least in some fashion or form, um, uh, a, a goal or an outcome, uh, whatever it may be. Because ultimately, as, as we were kind of uh, discussing a little bit, is that we have a whole bunch of different types of identities or components to an identity that can ultimately uh, shape different lived experiences that we might have in terms of uh, the job that we can, uh, that we can obtain or uh, where we live or uh, even our own health, as, as the second point talks about, is that these can actually be determinants of our own health in terms of, you know, if I have a good income or, or a steady, consistent, uh, reliable income, that means I could probably afford healthcare in some fashion. Or if I'm fully employed and my employer gives me health benefits, then I can be covered in that aspect. Um, or even other aspects as well in terms of being homelessness, how does that affect my of my health and my well-being and my access to, to, uh, to care. And also my own experience uh, working with a practitioner themselves if I were to be homeless. And so ultimately, uh, yeah, we should really kind of ask ourselves, are there any social determinants of, uh, determinants of health that could shape the experiences and outcomes of a given disease? Um, and uh, even if it might be that the, the disease or the uh, uh, health condition might be uh, kind of like, you know, in terms of the discussion of it, kind of devoid of any types of uh, social determinants, it's always important to kind of keep those in mind. Uh, one of the things actually, as, as an example too, is how um, in the research, uh, there's a very common seizure medication uh, that's readily used for people, wait, yeah, uh, for, that are readily used for people who have seizures or epilepsy. Um, but it's only been more recently that the research has shown that this very commonly used medication that's uh, prescribed um, actually is detrimental to uh, certain uh, Asian and Asian American populations. Uh, namely, uh, for this particular one, it was due to a biomarker that they identified and that um, this uh, seizure medication could actually cause um, detrimental or adverse health effects. In particular, it could cause uh, anything to um, health, or I'm sorry, organ failure, as well as even death as well. And it was only recently that uh, some research that specifically honed in on certain populations, namely in this case, it was uh, Asian, uh, Asian American populations. And I should stress, it wasn't all Asians or all Asian Americans, it was a certain, um, population or community that just had this certain biomarker um, were more susceptible to it. Yeah, I can definitely share the, the link to it. Yeah, for sure. I just kind of uh, recently read about it. So uh, that was just kind of a uh, rarely applied example. But yeah, I'll, I'll definitely share the, uh, one, uh, the link to it in, um, in an email 
for sure. Yeah, since I already have your names, I could probably find your emails, so it should be easy enough. But yeah, of course, yeah. And then ultimately, we really have to consider then, uh, you know, the question uh, that we should always ask ourselves, can we have intersectional, intersectionality as part of an outcome? Um, rather than always just kind of having the outcome being uh, strictly about like reducing depression or uh, whatever the, the, the type of uh, disease or, or health condition that you're trying to address in the, you know, complete rehabilitation of the patient, you know, what we really want to look into is also like, is that rehabilitation intersectional? Is it really being applied um, to all the various diversities that we have uh, with, our, with our patients, with our uh, communities, and so on. And speaking of uh, research subjects in particular is what we really need to also consider is where is that subject located on the, on the roadmap? And as I said, the roadmap might be a little bit incomplete um in some ways um and that's really because like with the health sciences in particular um it's only been more recently that uh all, that researchers have been adopting intersectionality into the work um because I, like i said intersectionality as as an official or our coin term only came about in 1980 uh, 1989 so it's only been a few decades that intersectionality has become a thing and uh, originally, as, as uh, I alluded to before, it was originally in legal scholarship. And only until much later did it start getting applied in other fields like education, business, um, and, uh, and other types of humanities. And then ultimately, only more recently in the health sciences and, and, and the clinical sciences. So there's uh, the research that has been kind of approached from this theoretical lens is very scarce at the moment, but it is building uh, for sure. And uh, there have been some um, key takeaways to really consider, especially as we not only look at that more recent literature from health sciences, but also the insights that are, have been gained from methodologies and practices in education and business and so on, how they're doing their research in an intersectional uh, framework. Uh, one of the things that they have stressed is to involve your patients and communities in the research process as much as possible. Now, in a traditional research lens, this might actually seem kind of counterintuitive because that kind of signals the idea of that it would invite bias, right? Uh, because as a researcher, you're supposed to be kind of the objective third party presence uh, that's observing uh, the realities of your patients or the communities that you're studying and objectively writing it down and observing it, measuring it, and so on. Thing is though, as a researcher, you're bringing in your own um, intersecting identities, whether or not you acknowledge them, uh, in the sense of like, how are you measuring uh, the, the effect of maybe an intervention or some other effect on, on a community or, uh, how are you writing it up later on? Are you writing it from the perspective of how it, uh, how it affected the community? Or are you writing it kind of from your own position as the researcher um, in that sense? Whose voice is being, um, being included in, in the research? And uh, there's a lot of communities, particularly uh, marginalized communities uh, like BIPOC communities, um, LGBTQIA+, indigenous as well, that have had really, well, yeah, really horrible experiences historically and contemporarily uh, from researchers and particularly from uh, medical researchers and medical practitioners. There's been a lot of uh, gross uh, mistreatment when it comes to that. And so uh, understandably, these communities might have some distrust uh, towards uh, practitioners and, and um, researchers, but it's, it's easy, it, it would be easy to say, well, if they're not trusting me, then I can't do anything uh, as a researcher, as a practitioner to help them. That's, that's not really what you should be concluding. It's like, I should work harder to really get, to rebuild this type of trust. Because unfortunately as a researcher, well, not unfortunately, but as a researcher or as a practitioner, you are representing a certain type of institution, whether it be, you know, the the institution of research, institution of medical 
uh, practice and such like that, you are kind of being in that role of that represent uh, that representation. So you kind of do have to, you know, work towards rebuilding that type of trust and that type of relationship. Um, and so uh, ultimately what is really important is to ideally, as much as you can involve them in the process, whether it's about uh, developing uh, the, the research question, like is like, does the question really relate to something that they need or that they are interested in or, you know, something that's important to them? Or is it something that you're just kind of more interested in, in terms of your kind of separated position from it? Um, it could also be in the actual write-up of the, uh, the article or whatever type of report that you're doing, having their kind of um, editing voice in there can be pretty helpful in some ways. Though, though I should stress, it does require a lot more work on that end because you're having to now uh, include um, uh, participants or, uh, or communities. And so as a result, you're having to do that extra communication with them and then extra editing and stuff like that. So that could be a lot of work, but as a researcher or as a practitioner, it is important in that sense. Um, so I see a question. Is intersectionality applicable to all fields of study? Um, yeah, it would just kind of manifest in different ways, ultimately, because I think um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and all the issues that are associated with it, I think it kind of affects a lot of uh, pretty much every field and pretty much every sphere of our lives in, in some fashion or form. And so each field or discipline or um, academic approach or professional approach probably has some sort of contribution to make in that sense. I, I would probably argue in that sense. It won't look the same across all the different types of disciplines, but we can definitely gain insights from, uh, from our colleagues in education, our colleagues in the humanities and so on and kind of uh, working towards that uh, interprofessional approach as it would be, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, and then ultimately, uh, really uh, talking about um, or being much more aware of critical barriers when it comes to recruiting diverse participants in research. This is actually a really long standing issue and still happens now that there are a lot of barriers that are in place, uh, whether, whether as researchers we are aware of them or not, they are definitely there. Uh, when it comes to uh, different types of participants, whether they're maybe like trans. Uh, participants or they are uh, homeless or that they are um, in, in poverty or otherwise in uh, have a uh, have lower incomes and so so on that they can't make the time to participate in your research studies and so on or they can't uh, continue with uh, as, as participants and so on so it's really uh, important to be aware of those type of barriers especially as a uh, as it relates to your own study and really have to ask yourself, how am I being inclusive uh, towards different types of uh, uh, participants, different types of communities and so on, and really trying to uh, reach out to them as well. And that's actually what uh, has been contributing that whole uh, homogenous uh, sampling that we've been doing uh, as, as researchers, just in general about how a lot of the samples that we collect are largely white and cis male. Because uh, they tip, uh, for those like me, it, it can be uh, a lot easier to get a certain type of income, to get a certain type of education and other things that could ultimately support us to participate in this type of research or, or be uh, sought out in that way. Because we're, uh, we could be technically a lot easier as, as research subjects. Um, and then, yeah, asking ourselves, how can we work on addressing these barriers? Um, really, how do we support our research subjects so that they can continue participating in our, in our, in our work and ultimately feel like uh, they have a voice in that work as well? Because you're, you're, you're kind of like recording their lives, essentially. You're examining their lives. So you ultimately will have the final say uh, as to how the research will uh, depict them, how it will portray them, how it will examine them. Um, I, either when you like publish the work or when you use it for a certain type of clinical intervention of some kind, it'll essentially affect them. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, also finally just recognizing the diversity within entire communities or populations. That's I think something also important within intersectionality 
is that oftentimes, especially with research, we often put people in certain categories, like in terms of race and, and gender and so on, and we kind of put these like uh, very fixed labels or very simplified labels, but don't really acknowledge that there's incredible diversity of experiences happening uh, within, uh, you know, say the black community or the indigenous communities or, and so on, because even like Native American, right? Uh, as a Native American, there's a whole host of different nations and sovereignties and, and cultures happening that maybe gets reduced down or simplified uh, within a, a research scope. So, or even LGBTQ. There's a whole host of different needs and expectations and, and roles and, and uh, experiences and attitudes and, and so on uh, within uh, that community. Uh, now we can't just simply just put them all within the other category, right? So with that, uh, I know we have just a few more minutes and that's totally fine. Basically, kind of just ending with about intersectional strategies. And uh, some other strategies to kind of really, really consider in, in addition to uh, like doing actual research or like doing the actual methodology of a, of a research study is also in the um, appraisal of evidence. So say as a practitioner who is seeking to be very evidence-based in their approach or as a student as well, if you're trying to evaluate sources for your literature review or anything like that, uh, it's important that when you do the critical appraisal of evidence that you should incorporate intersectionality. I'm sure you've, like, you're learning about different types of, uh, you know, critical appraisal tools like uh, Joanna Briggs or, um, or GRADE or anything like that, or Prisma would be another example, but uh, those uh, particular appraisal tools or approaches don't necessarily incorporate uh, an appraisal of, say, intersectionality. Like, is the study really diverse in its sampling? Uh, did it actually seek out the communities that it was, it was supposedly uh, measuring? How did it ultimately uh, operationalize race? How did it define gender? So on. Uh, so it's really important to kind of consider those as well. And then ultimately also is how does a modality or treatment impact different communities and populations? Because even though you might see that the studies are showing an increase of uh, or improvement using say like cognitive therapy or something like that when it comes to a certain uh, uh, patient or a certain uh, uh, health condition that they're having, as, as we showed with, as, or as we kind of discussed with the seizure medication, just because seizure medication, that particular seizure medication was uh, useful for many uh, different types of patient communities, it was actually detrimental or maybe non-effective for others. Uh, so really you have to kind of consider that idea of equity is that clinical approach that you're using equitably impacting all the different populations and communities that you're working with. So it's important to kind of assess that with an, with an equity minded approach. And then ultimately too is uh, acknowledging that you're susceptible to bias. And this bias could be, uh, you know, uh, we could talk about gender bias and racial bias and so on, but it's also can be inclusive of cognitive bias as well as uh, algorithmic bias. In fact, the search tools that you use like databases, internet search tools like Google and all that, they also have their own biases and they can actually impact uh, the evidence that you look at in terms of uh, race and gender and all the other types of intersecting identities. And if you're ever interested in that, it's one of my uh, top topics to, top, uh, to talk about. So if you're ever, you're ever interested in that. And I do uh, oftentimes host a uh, workshop on those particular issues too. Uh, but yeah, so it's important to kind of consider these as well. And then um, finally, this is the last kind of thing, is with intersectionality, it has a lot of connecting uh, theories with it. And these theories are actually going to be talked about in the uh, upcoming uh, workshops as well in different fashions and forms, but ultimately being tied by that common thread of intersectionality. Uh, so we have like queer theory, which kind of approaches uh, the issues of heteronormativity and cisnormativity when it relates to LGBTQIA plus communities. Uh, we have like critical race theory, which approaches with that anti-racist framework. Um, 
and also with feminist theories, which are really uh, great when it comes to deconstructing issues uh, regarding women, uh, but also issues of power. Uh, so with all of these, they have all their own uh, elements that they kind of approach or pursue, but they all really kind of tie back into intersectionality, kind of really uh, adhering to that principle that we can't just say there's a race problem there or a gender problem there. It's more than likely going to be some sort of combination or intersection of all those different types of issues uh, simultaneously. Um, but yeah, uh, so with that, I think we're kind of at the end, which is perfect <laughs> since we just hit the hour. Um, so at this point, um, thank you for, for joining me uh, with this particular journey into intersectionality. I hope it was uh, pretty interesting or at least insightful in some form, but is there any uh, questions that I can uh, answer or any comments that you want to just share? I do see in the chat. I plan to do my capstone project with cultural awareness and this presentation has been super helpful in helping me to narrow down my topic. Awesome, I'm glad. I think it is super important to include in intersectionality after watching this presentation. Awesome, that's exactly what I was kind of hoping, uh, that it would have some sort of uh, you know, insight into that. So I'm, I'm really glad. I'm, I, I would be excited to see how you apply intersectionality in your, uh, in your project, so thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. <laughs> Need to figure that out. Yeah, if you ever want to consult on anything, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'll put my email in the uh, uh, in the chat, actually, if you ever want to have any questions. And that is extended to anyone else who uh, is attending, too. Awesome. 